In this video, we're going to take a look at section 3.1 on quadratic functions. A quadratic function is a function of one of the following forms. You'll either see it as f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c. Excuse me, I just had dinner. Uh, this is called the standard form. Or you might see it in the form of f of x equals a times x minus h squared plus k. This is called the vertex form. And this form you should recognize from chapter 2. Uh, this is a square function. So we talked about that family of functions in chapter 2 and how you can use transformations to graph that type of function when it's in this form. Um, you know, h shifts the graph left or right. K shifts it up or down. A is stretching or shrinking. If there's a negative sign with that, it's flipping the graph over. All the stuff that we talked about in chapter two for transformations. And so we saw this kind of function already. Now we're going to delve a little bit deeper into the topic and also include the standard form and talk about how we would go about graphing a quadratic function when it's in that form. Either one of these, the graph is a parabola. We saw that in chapter two with this form. This form will continue to have the same shape. So a quadratic function, which is also a square function, the graph is a parabola shape. Right. So here's an example of what one of these functions might look like when we graph them. And I intentional, intentionally removed the details of this graph because I don't want to focus on the details. I want to focus on the broad concepts, the broad characteristics of a parabola that are important to a parabola. And often the first um, characteristic that students will identify when I ask in class is this point here, which is the very top of the graph. That's clearly a really important point for the parabola. It's the highest point on the graph that makes it important right away. Uh, but in addition to that, another way you can think of this point is it's the point where the graph stops increasing and starts decreasing. So it's where it switches from increasing to decreasing or from decreasing to increasing, depending on which kind of parabola you're dealing with. Right. And so this point is called the vertex. Right? And so that's one important feature of a parabola that we've uh, we've identified by looking at the graph. And because it's important to the graph, it's something that we want to find from the equation. So what we're going to be doing for the rest of this video is talking about once we've identified all these important features, how do we find that information when we're given an equation? So we can get the important features out of our equation and then use it to graph the equation. Um, if the parabola is going this way, which is maybe you might think the normal way for a parabola to go, the vertex would be the bottom of the graph. So in this case, the vertex would be the lowest point on the graph. So the vertex is either going to be the lowest point on your graph or the highest point on your graph. But either way, it's the point where the graph changes direction. Here it's decreasing, then it's increasing. Once it passes the vertex, it starts increasing. Here it's increasing, then it's decreasing. All right. Really important point, and it's definitely one that we want to find from our equations. Another important point is this point here, the y-intercept. That would be a good point for us to know. Uh, so when we're plotting, when we're graphing this and we're plotting points, we, you know, what makes it important is because it's noticeable. That's what makes it important. So I kind of said that sentence weird. What makes it important is that it is noticeable. When we draw our graph and we share that graph with somebody else to look at, this will be one of the first things that they'll notice is where is it crossing the y-axis? It's an easy reference point. It's usually pretty easy to see where it's crossing the y-axis. And so we want to have that point exactly in the right place. If it's not, it'll be really noticeable to somebody. And, you know, like for the teacher, for example, if I'm looking at your graph, and I'm expecting the graph to cross the y-axis at a certain point, I can check real quickly to see if it does. And if it doesn't, it's just going to make your graph, glass, it's going to make your graph look um, incorrect, right? So it's just, it just stands out if that point's not in the right place. That's just a simple way to say it. 
All right, so that's a point that we will want to be uh, finding from our equation. All right, um, the, and so you probably could imagine, well, if we want to find the y-intercept, if that's an important feature that we want to find from our equation, uh, then the x-intercepts are also going to be important. And so we have an x-intercept here where the graph crosses the x-axis. Again, important because it's noticeable, but also there's other, there's other things about the x-intercept that make it important. Um, it's where the y-value is zero, and that's a very common thing to be asked to find. And so that makes it important as well. You can use it for solving quadratic equations. We talked about that in the video in chapter one, solving quadratic equations, that you can actually use a graph to solve those equations. And the solution to the equation would be the x-intercepts. So they, they serve multiple purposes and they're, they're important points. So we wanna make sure we find them and we graph them correctly. This parabola has two x-intercepts. This one that I drew over here has none. And so it's possible that a parabola may not cross the x-axis at all, in which case there are no x-intercepts. Now you might say, well, this one doesn't have a y-intercept either, but it does. It's just going to be a while before we get to see it, but it's going to keep going to the right as it goes up, and it, eventually these will cross. And so every parabola, every parabolic function will have a y-intercept at some point but they don't always all have x-intercepts. You might have two, you might not have any, and the last possibility is you might have just one. So if I have a parabola where the vertex, oh, I just did a really bad job of drawing that, where the vertex is on the x-axis, so here's the vertex, that vertex is also an x-intercept, and so this parabola has exactly one x-intercept. So we could have one, we can have zero or we could have two. Those are the range of possibilities with the x-intercept. And then there's a couple of more features that we can identify about this parabola, but they're a little bit harder to notice and to point out. Um, you know, these are physical parts of the graph, so those are a little bit easier to see. The ones that aren't quite as physically present are the symmetry of the parabola, right? The, par the parabola has a symmetry to it. The left half of it is just the mirror image of the right half. And the half, the halving occurs at the vertex. So if we draw an imaginary vertical line through the vertex, the parabola is symmetric about that particular vertical line. This is called the axis of symmetry. And so that will be another thing that we will want to identify from our equation. Right, it's the axis of symmetry. <clears throat> Every parabola has one. So does this one, right? So if we draw a vertical line through this vertex, the parabola is symmetric to that vertical line. And then the last thing, it's also an easy thing and maybe the least helpful thing that we will identify, but sometimes parabolas are upside down like this. Sometimes they're right side up. We have a name for that. This is called the opening of the parabola. And so this one we would say opens up. And this one we would say opens down. And it turns out you can pretty easily identify which one you're going to be dealing with by looking at the equation. It's, it doesn't even require a calculation. You can just see, you can just look at your equation and tell whether it's gonna open up or down just looking at it. And I'll tell you how to do that in just a second. So the opening of the parabola is another one that, because it's, it's, it's the least helpful, but it's so easy to identify that it, you might as well just throw it in there with everything else. And so these are all the things that we want to identify from our equation to help us with graphing these functions, with the goal being to graph these quadratic functions with the same degree of precision that we graph linear equations, right? So if I want to graph a line, I know exactly how to pick apart the equation to get specifically what I need in order to draw that graph accurately and efficiently, right? We're trying, you know, so when I find the slope and the y-intercept, right? So if I'm graphing like y equals 2x plus 3, I know I got the y-intercept at 0, 3. I get that point right away. I just pick it right out of the equation. And then I get the slope, which is 2. And I think of it as 2 over 1. And so from here, I go up 2 to the right 1. I get another point. And with those two points, I can draw the graph 
accurately, precisely, and quickly, right? And so we get a really accurate graph with, with the most pertinent information. I don't know, maybe that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but um, you know, the slope and the y-intercept help us draw the graph really well and really quickly. So we dissect the equation and use that information to help us draw the graph really well. We want to be able to do the same thing with quadratic functions, but as you probably could imagine, it's a more complicated shape, so there's more things to identify to get that same level of precision that we do when we graph lines. You know, a line's not that complicated, right? You get two points, and as long as you draw the line straight enough between those two points, that gives you a pretty accurate representation of the graph. Parabolas take a little bit more effort to get all the pieces together to make the graph as accurate as our lines are accurate. All right, so we're identifying all these things. The opening of the parabola, the vertex of the parabola, the axis of symmetry, the y-intercept, and the x-intercepts. We'll find all of that information from our functions, from our equations, and once, once we've identified all, those inf all that information, sorry, it's just, Okay, so I'll just explain why it's a little bit weird, like why I'm talking funny. Um, I don't know, this is my excuse anyways. Uh, so it's the middle of the week, like I'm teaching summer school right now. I have like one, I have two classes. Um, and so I teach in the morning and usually when I come home, you know, I, I grade or I'll do things, I'll, I'll type things up, but I don't usually record another video because I've already been talking for four hours today. Um, but I'm kind of behind on my recordings because of that, because I tried to just do it on the weekends. And now I've hit a point where I've got to get these recorded so that I can get them out in time for the students to like progress through the course. And so I'm recording in the evening after dinner, after I've already taught earlier today. So I'm already kind of exhausted, but I got to get these done. So I'm sorry. I feel like I'm not speaking very well. Maybe it's not as bad. Maybe it won't look as bad as it seems to me right now, but Anyways, what was I even saying? We want to identify all of these things from our equations and then use that information to help us draw these parabolas with as much accuracy as possible. We want to make them look as good as we can. All right, so this is what we just identified on the previous screen. So these five things. And if you're thinking, oh, that's a lot of stuff. These problems are going to take forever. I'm going to have to type in a whole bunch of information on Math Excel. And, and the answer is yes, you're going to have to do that and just get used to it because chapter three is like that the whole way through. There is not, there, okay, there's a couple of exceptions, but most of the problems that we deal with in chapter three are multi step, multi part problems. It's just every problem is going to be lengthy in this chapter for the most part. That will change when we get to chapter four. The problems will be a little bit quicker, but for chapter three, just, just prepare yourself. It's going to be like this all the way through it. All right. So here's a quadratic function. It's a square function. This is given in the vertex form, all right? It's supposed to be an arrow there. Sorry about that. Uh, it's the vertex form. And that makes a difference. How we extract the information will be different if the equation's in vertex form versus if it's in standard form. So we have to identify what form we're dealing with in order to know how to go about getting the information that we need. All right, now this one asks for the vertex axis of symmetry. That's the order it's asking for the information. And you, you can see here, the first answer you'll have to type in is the vertex. But I, I don't know, my habit was always finding the opening first, because as I mentioned a moment ago, it's really easy to identify whether it opens up or down. So I start with that. Um, so here, so what we want to do is compare the function we were given to the formula that was in vertex form, the one that we saw on the previous screen. So this is a quadratic function formula in vertex form. And to determine the opening of the parabola, all right, so we're trying to figure this out. All you have to do is look at the value of A. If A is positive, it opens up. If A is negative, it opens down, right? If A is negative, it flips the parabola over, right? If you think about chapter two, right? If there's a positive in front of the square function, it's just a parabola. But if you put a negative sign there, it flips the graph over and it's gonna be upside down, which means it opens down. 
So for this particular function, there is no number in front of the parentheses, which means it's, a, it's an invisible one. So for this function, a is equal to one, which is positive. And so this parabola opens up. And so I'm writing a bunch of stuff down to talk about that. But in general, you won't have to write anything down. There's no calculation to do. You can just see the value of a in the equation. And if it's a positive number, it doesn't matter whether it's one or five or a hundred or even a fraction, if it's like one half, if it's positive, the graph opens up, the parabola opens up. If it's negative, negative one, negative 100, negative 10, negative one half, then the parabola opens down. So it's as simple as that. So if that number is positive, opens up. If it's negative, opens down. Right. So that takes care of the opening of the parabola. So I like to do that one first, and then I do the vertex. Now the vertex in this case is also pretty simple. So maybe I should rewrite my equation down here for this. Right. X minus four squared minus nine. The vertex, when it's in vertex form, this is why it's called vertex form, because if the function is in vertex form, you get the vertex for free. You can just read it off the equation as well. So just like we read A straight off the equation to see if it, if it opens up or down, you can do the same with the vertex. The vertex is simply at H comma K. And we can read H and K off of the equation, and that, that's gonna be our vertex. Right. So this is very similar to what we were doing in chapter two with the transformations. Right. H is the number that follows the minus sign in this equation. So the minus sign is already in the formula. H is the number after the minus sign, which is a four and it's positive. H is positive four in this case. So think back to chapter two. Hopefully you, you learned this in chapter two. That this minus four here shifts the graph to the right. Even though it's a minus four, it actually shifts the graph to the right four, which is why the vertex is now located at four comma something, right? Um, so it's gonna be positive four for H because that's where the vertex will now be located. K, however, keeps the sign of the number that we see in the equation. So in this case, K is negative nine. All right, so for H, it's, you know, we have a minus four in the equation that makes H positive four. H will be the opposite sign of what's indicated in the equation, but K keeps the sign of the number that's indicated in the equation. That's the best way I could think to say it. And so again, no calculation. We can just read those numbers off the equation, put them together as an ordered pair, and now we have our vertex. All right, so that takes care of that. Now we can go ahead and plot that point if we want, right? So with the opening of the parabola, you can't really do anything with that. Right, not yet anyways, but for the vertex, we can go ahead and plot that point. So we have four comma negative nine. I'll need to scroll down here to, so you can see this four comma negative nine. Now you might be worried about how low this point is, right? So I have a certain limited window in which to draw my graph and four comma negative nine is at the bottom of that window. So you might feel like, oh, maybe I won't have room to plot more points here, but I know I will because the parabola opens up from that point. So when we say opens up or down, I really think that's in reference to the vertex. The parabola opens up from the vertex or it opens down from the vertex. For this function, it's gonna open up. This is the vertex, but from here, the parabola opens up. So the graph will not exist below this point. So it's gonna be okay that I'm kind of already low in, in the window in the frame that I have because from that point, the graph is only going to go up and I have plenty of room to work with going up. All right. So the next thing uh, in the list, what was it? Uh, the axis of symmetry. Yeah, I always, I, I would, if I wouldn't have looked, I probably would have forgot to mention it until like at the end. Then I would say, oh yeah, there's one more thing. Um, this one's also easy once you have the vertex. So once you've identified the vertex, the axis of symmetry it's just the vertical line that passes through that vertex. So I can draw it on here right away, right? This is the axis of symmetry right here. If I could draw it as a straight line, which I didn't really do a good job, but you get the idea. This vertical line that passes through the vertex is my axis of symmetry. And the way we mathematically describe vertical lines is as a value of X, right? So this is where X is equal to four, right? 
every point on this vertical line, the x coordinate is 4. So that's the way we describe that vertical line. This is where x is equal to 4, which is just the x coordinate of the vertex, which is why I'm drawing this arrow here, right? So the axis of symmetry is just whatever the x coordinate of the vertex is, x equals that number. That's your axis of symmetry. And that, that's the case every single time. So no matter how you find your, um, get my thinking of two different ways to say the same sentence, and then I, in the middle of saying it one way, I switch to the other way. So uh, I don't know what's wrong with my mind. Uh, regardless of how you are finding the vertex, this is always how you get the axis of symmetry. Okay, so it's x equals the x coordinate of the vertex. That's how you get the axis of symmetry every time. Okay. Okay. So that's axis of symmetry. I'm sorry. I don't know why this is, uh, my work is going sideways. And again, these are lengthy problems. There's lots of things to find. Some it's going to be kind of messy. Um, I'm not the most organized person. So let's write the equation down here so we can do the next thing. So we have f of x equals x minus 4 squared uh, minus 9. Now, I always forget that I can slide the screen to the left or to the right. I'm not used to that because on my smart board in my classroom, that's not an option. It's just up or down only. And so this is kind of nice to be able to like get some more room to the left or to the right. So maybe I'll take advantage of that here. So the next thing we want to find is the y-intercept. And to find the y-intercept, you do the same thing that you have always done to find the y-intercept. And maybe you don't remember this, but we talked about finding x and y-intercepts in chapter one when we were graphing lines. Now, you might say, oh yeah, you just talked about it here too, right? We just talked about it here that the y-intercept is three. That's how I get the y-intercept. I just get this number from the equation. That only works in certain cases, like, when it's y equals mx plus b, yes, b is the y-intercept, and you could just read it straight off the equation. But that doesn't always, it doesn't always work that way, right? Sometimes you have to calculate it. The process we talked about for calculating it is to set um, x equal to zero and then solve for y. So I'm gonna, I wanna write that down somewhere. So for the y-intercept, step one, you set x equal to zero because this point that's on the y-axis has to have an x coordinate of zero. So if you're trying to find this point that's on the y axis, you know the x value must be zero, so you set x equal to zero, plug that into the equation, and then solve for y. And so this is what we talked about in chapter one. I'm reviewing it again with you here, but from this point on, you just need to remember it because we're gonna be doing some more graphing here and there throughout the rest of the course. You know, pretty frequently, honestly, about like half I don't know, maybe half is a little bit of an exaggeration. So, but you know, a good chunk of this chapter is going to be graphing and there's a little bit in chapter four, maybe not so much in chapter five. So I wouldn't say half that's, that was too much, but the Y intercept never changes. It's always these two steps and there's nothing more to the story. You plug in zero for X, you solve it for Y, you get a point, you plot the point. That's what the y-intercept does every time. So, but you need to remember that. So no matter how the equation changes, this process never changes to find the y-intercept, right? So let's go ahead and do that here, right? So the first step is to set x equal to zero. And so I'll get zero minus four squared minus nine. And then you simplify. And I say you solve it for y. And remember that the function notation is the y variable, right? So this is my y. And all I have to do is simplify the right-hand side to find out what y is equal to. And so this will be negative 4 squared minus 9, which is going to be 16 minus 9, right? Positive 16 minus 9, which is going to be 7. So y is equal to 7. Now remember, I set x equal to 0, and I guess if I'm going to put a step 1, I should put a step 2, right? So step 1, set x equal to 0. Step 2, solve for y. You get y equals 7. And this gives you your y-intercept. 0 for x, 7 for y. And there's a point, and that's what you're going to type into Math Excel, and then you're going to plot that point on your paper, right? And it's actually kind of a ways away from the vertex, because, you know, the vertex is at, is at x equals 4, 
And so that gives the parabola some time to kind of really move away from the vertex. It's heading up pretty rapidly. And so we're going to have this point here at 0, comma, positive 7. It's going to be way up here. All right. And so that's going to be, I'm just like, you might say, what's the big deal? Why are you like making a point out of that? And I'm just thinking, this is going to be so hard for me to draw. Connecting that point way down here to this point and trying to do it as a smooth parabola shape. I'm going to butcher this here in just a second. But before I do, let's get a couple more points, right? The next thing we're supposed to find, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. The next thing we're supposed to find is the x-intercepts. So let's go ahead and check some more things off here. We already found the axis of symmetry. We just found the y-intercept. Now we're supposed to find the x-intercepts. So here's, a, here's an interesting idea. I can actually get more space just going up, too. I should just do it up here. All right. Now, the x-intercept is the same steps as it was in Chapter 1 also. So the steps will never change. Anytime you want to find an x-intercept, it's on the x-axis, which means that y has to equal 0. So to find the x-intercept, we will first set y equal to 0, and then you solve for x. So that's what we did in chapter 1. That's what we're doing here in 3.1. And any time in the future that you're asked to find the x-intercepts, that's what you'll do. It's the same steps every time. However, there are sometimes more things going on. I don't know how to say it. I didn't really say that very well. Um, finding the x-intercepts, there's sometimes more to the story. So I mentioned for the y-intercept, there's nothing more to the story. You set x equal to 0, you solve for y, end of story, right? It just, you get a point, you plot it. The x-intercepts will sometimes have some more interesting information to go along with it. So the story might become more interesting. However, the steps still never change. So to find the x-intercept, you will always set y equal to 0 and then try to solve for x. Now, the solving for x part will become more challenging as the equations become more challenging. And like I said, in addition to the extra challenge of solving for x, you might get some extra information to go along with your x-intercepts. I'm just trying to, I'm foreshadowing a little bit of something we're going to see later in chapter 3. But just keep that in mind, that even though there might be extra information for us to find, the actual steps will still be the same. It'll be set y equal to 0, solve for x. So let's go ahead and do that with this problem, right? We have f of x equals x minus 4 squared plus 9. And here is my y variable, right? So remember, f of x is the y variable. And we want to set that equal to 0, right? So we're going to have 0 equals x minus 4 squared plus 9. And now, and that's step 1. Step two is to solve this for x. And so we have to, it's a quadratic equation, essentially, right? I'm trying to solve this for x. Well, this is a quadratic equation, which we also learned how to solve back in chapter one. And now we're being asked to retrieve that information here in chapter three. And I've said it, I'm pretty sure I've said it in multiple videos that you can't just forget things in this class. You can't learn it just long enough to get through that test and then think that you don't have to worry about it anymore. It will show back up. And this is especially true in chapter four. There are a lot of topics in chapter four that utilize concepts from chapter two. And again, I, I have the issue of students who they got through chapter two, they seem to do okay with the test, but then when you bring the stuff up again in chapter four, it's like they never learned it. So you have to make sure you're internalizing this stuff. You have to make sure you're understanding it and that you're keeping it with you, at least through the class. You know, now after you've, you're done with college algebra, if you don't have to take any more math classes, then you can forget about this stuff. But you have to learn it well enough to get you through a few months uh, because you're going to see it again. When we introduce something in this class, it always shows up again later. Almost always. I mean, there's some exceptions. Again, I'm speaking with a little bit of hyperbole there, but like circles, for example, I keep thinking of that, but even that shows up later. We're going to see a couple of examples with circles in chapter five. So, so they really do find ways to bring up almost everything that we learn earlier again later in the course. So how do we solve this quadratic equation? Well, this one you could solve by factoring. That's one method one we can solve because there's just one X in the whole equation. We can just get the X by itself. So to get x by itself, we'll start by subtracting 9 to the other side. Uh, okay, I was going to say, uh, this is, okay, so what made me hesitate there was 
the next step would be to take the square root. That's a negative number. It's going to be imaginary. And I was like, wait a minute. I didn't think I picked a problem where that happened. So if that does happen, it's a teachable moment. All right, I made a mistake, but let me make it a teachable moment. If you do get imaginary solutions when you're solving for X, that means there's no X intercepts. So if you try to find the X intercepts and you get imaginary answers, the proper response to that on math Excel is to say, there are no X intercepts on this graph. And that's what I would have to say if I hadn't made a mistake here. So you probably already caught it if you're paying attention. Um, I, I don't know why I made this mistake, but it's a minus nine instead of a plus nine. I don't, I don't know what I was thinking, right? So look at the original equation down here. It's supposed to be a minus nine, right? Now, to solve this for x, we add nine to both sides. Right? And that's gonna give us a result. Now, the reason you might say, well, how, how would I know whether I should be, like, how would I know if I made a mistake just because I got imaginary, maybe I'm supposed to. Well, that's why it's helpful to know whether the parabola opens up or down when you find the vertex. Because here's the vertex, the parabola opens up from here. So if you imagine that parabola opening up from the vertex, it has to cross the X axis, which means there has to be X intercepts. It, there, you know, like the way this graph is going, we have to get some solutions out of this that aren't imaginary. So when I saw that I was about to get an imaginary solution, not only do I know better because I've done this problem before, but I should know because of how this graph is starting to set itself up. The graph should be crossing the X axis. I should be getting actual answers here, not imaginary answers. Again, imaginary answers are actual answers too, but they have to be real numbers in order to show up in this graph. And I know I should have some, so I shouldn't be getting imaginary solutions here, right? So that's kind of how I knew I had an issue and I fixed it, right? So I went back, fixed my mistake. Now I'm going forward again. Everything's working out fine. Take the square root of both sides. The square root of nine is going to be three. Here, the square root cancels out the power of two and we get X minus four. And remember, this is from chapter one. If you take the square root of both sides, you have to put plus or minus on that result. And then we can get X by itself by adding four to the other side. So we'll add four. I'll put that in front of the plus or minus. That's just kind of the natural place to put it. And we get four plus or minus three is equal to X. Now, in a lot of problems in chapter one, when we use plus or minus, we could just leave that in our answer. But the one exception to that, and you know, which is what's occurring right here as well, is that if the numbers are nice and you could combine them together, you don't want to leave it with plus or minus, right? Four plus three combines together to give me seven. So I don't want to leave it as four, four plus or minus three when I can actually combine these numbers together if I just separate the answers out. So if you can simplify it more by separating them out, then you should go ahead and do that. But not only that, in this problem, we want to graph these points and I can't graph them if they're in plus or minus form. I need to know separately what the two X intercepts are. So let's split this up. I guess I'll do that over here. And we get one answer using the plus sign and we get one answer using the minus sign. I'm just really horrible at drawing threes. Um, so can I fix that? Not really, okay. But we get seven as one value of X and we get one as the other value of X. So these are my X intercepts. Remember, we set Y equal to zero here. And so we're gonna pair these X values with that value of Y. And so we have seven comma zero and we have one comma zero. So those are my two X intercepts. And again, you should have two. That's another thing to be aware of because sometimes on the test, students do, they forget the plus or minus and they just get one answer. They just get seven and they still draw the graph and they have seven marked, but they don't mark anything for the other X intercept. And it's like, they don't even realize there is another one, right? And that they missed it because they forgot the plus or minus. But if you look at this, here's the vertex. It opens up from here. There, it crosses the x-axis twice. So I should have two x-intercepts, not just one. So we have one at seven comma zero, and we have one at one comma zero, all right? And that's it, all right? We found everything they asked us to find. We get these four points. So best case scenario, when you find all that information, you get, you get five points actually. So we got these four. Now the fifth point that we can get for free is using the symmetry that we have here. So for every point on this side of the axis of symmetry, 
there should be a mirror image point the same distance away on the other side of the axis of symmetry. And for the x-intercepts, they already exhibit that symmetry, right? For this one here at one, that's three away from the axis of symmetry to the left. I go three to the right and I get the other x-intercept at seven. Right? But this point, we did not identify its mirror image point. So we can actually go ahead and identify that and get another point for free. This is four away from the axis of symmetry to the left. So if I go four to the right, I should have a mirror image point located there. So I get that point for free. So I have five points. And with these five points, with that symmetry, knowing that this bottom point is the vertex, all of that paints a really vivid picture of what this parabola looks like. And so we can go ahead and connect these points as a parabola. Don't make it a, like a, a sharp V shape. It's a smooth rounded curve. And I think I'm gonna pause it to draw it because I think when I try to do it live, I just mess it up because I talk while I try to write and it just doesn't work out very good. So let me pause the video. I'm gonna draw that parabola and then I'll resume it. Okay, so what I did, because it was such a distance, I zoomed out and that way it was less of a distance for me to have to actually draw on my screen. And this actually didn't turn out too bad. So, so that's what the parabola looks like and you're done. So let's move on to the next problem. I just was looking, as I stopped the recording, I was looking, I'm like, ah, it's already 35 minutes into the video and I've just barely done one example. So I'm really sorry about how much talking I do on these videos. Let's move on to the next example. Let's just keep things moving. All right, this one is in standard form. Right? So we have y equals negative three x squared plus 12 x minus four. This is standard form. This fits the formula of y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. We need to be able to identify this in order to know how to get the information that we need to get. All right, now for the opening, the, this formula has a, an a constant. I don't know what you wanna, it's really a constant, but you might think of it as a variable. But this formula has a in it, just like the vertex form has a. All right, so let's go back to this one, right? Has a as well. This a is the same as this a, it's the same a. So if you were to convert from one form to the other, that value of a would be the same in both forms. It's the same a, right? And it tells you the same thing, it works the same way. So this value of a is negative. So a is negative three. Since that's negative, that tells me the parabola opens down. If a is positive, then it opens up, right? So that's the opening of the parabola. Go ahead and get that out of the way. And again, I'm writing it out because I'm explaining it. But in reality, like if I'm just doing this problem, like let's say I'm making the solutions for the exam, I don't write all that stuff down. I can just look and see, oh, A is negative. It's going to open down. I just know the answer right away. And that's, you want to get to that same point. All right. So that's the opening. The next thing I would do is the vertex because it's really the most important point. If I had to pick one, it's the most important part of the parabola. This time, however, we don't get a free pass. We don't get to just pluck some numbers out of the uh, equation to figure out uh, the vertex, right? We don't just get to pluck the numbers out and just have the answer right away. We have to do a calculation, right? So there's a formula that you have to use for finding the vertex. And again, there, there's reasons why this is the formula that it is, but I won't go into it now because I'm already 40 minutes into this video and I don't want it to be a two hour long video like my last video was for the chapter two review, the test review, nearly two hours long. So um, the formula is negative B over two A. I'm not gonna get into it, but just briefly to explain where that's coming from. And then you can think about it if you wanna try to figure out why, why this works out, but it's right here. It's this part, it's this part of the quadratic formula. That's why this is what it is. So the X coordinate of the vertex will be at negative B over two A when the equation's written in standard form, right? So if it's in vertex form, it's just H comma K. You just grab those numbers off the equation, that becomes your vertex. When it's in standard form, you have to use the formula X equals negative B over two A to get the X coordinate of the vertex. And you might say, well, what about the Y coordinate? What's the formula for that? Well, there isn't a formula for it. You use the formula to get the X coordinate. And then when, when you find that number, you plug it into the equation to find the Y coordinate. 
So use the formula to get x, and then once you've identified the value for x, plug it into the equation to find y. Right? And this is not a really complicated, difficult formula, but it does sometimes give you fractions as answers. Now I don't think that's going to happen for us here, but just be prepared. Sometimes this will give you x equals one half, x equals negative three halves, things like that. And in and of itself, that's not so bad, but then you have to plug that into the equation. And that's where things get kind of bad when it's a fraction. All right. So this is going to be, well, B here is 12, right? B is 12. A, we've already identified as negative three. So I'm going to take this value for A and this value for B, plug it into this formula. So I'll get negative 12 over 2 times negative 3. That's going to give me negative 12 over negative 6, which is going to give me 2. So the x-coordinate of the vertex is 2. To find the y-coordinate, I will take this value of x and plug it into the function. I'll plug it into the equation. x, sorry, I said the wrong letter. y equals negative 3x squared plus 12x plus, sorry, I put plus again. I'm going to keep making mistakes and that's going to get me in trouble one of these times. All right, take that equation and plug 2 in for x. And then that will tell you what y is equal to for the vertex. So we will have, sorry, I guess I'm writing too fast. We will have y equals negative 3 times 2 squared plus 12 times 2 minus 4, which is going to give me negative 3 times 4 plus 24 minus 4 and I think I'm just going to skip usually I'll like kind of work out every little detail in those arithmetic situation you know there's just arithmetic here and usually I'll work out all the details of it but maybe I could stop doing that and say plug it in your calculator or you kind of figure it out uh, it's going to be well maybe I can't figure it out I think it's going to be 8 Let's see no that's not right yeah that's right so it'd be negative 12 I'm just going to do it negative 12 plus 24 is positive 12. 12 minus 4 is going to be 8. So we get y equals 8. So my vertex is at 2 comma 8. So I was going to write it up here, but I kind of have it down here. So I'll just leave it here. That's the vertex. We can go ahead and plot that point, right? 2 comma 8. Thankfully it fits. So we have 2 comma 8, which is right here. That's the vertex. Now you might say, uh oh, you don't have enough room above it. You might run out of space for your parabola. But remember, this one opens down. Right. So this is the vertex from here. It's going to open down. So I have plenty of room to fit the parabola. Also notice that it will cross the X axis twice. Right. It's going to cross somewhere over here, cross somewhere over here. So I should have X intercepts. They shouldn't be imaginary. They, they exist. So I have to find them. Right. Um, so that takes care of the vertex. The axis of symmetry. Once you have the vertex, even though we had to do a lot of work to find it, the axis of symmetry is still the same simple thing that it was last time, which is whatever the X coordinate of the vertex is, that's your axis of symmetry. So my axis of symmetry is at X equals two. I'm just gonna label that as axis, right? Um, and so that's what you would type into Math Excel for the axis of symmetry. You could also draw it on your graph, again, as a, an invisible, I used to say imaginary, but it's not really imaginary. I mean, that line's really there. It's really the symmetry. It's the line about which this graph is symmetric, but um, I don't know, semantics, right? So that's the axis of symmetry. Now we need to find the y-intercept. And this one's pretty easy. When it's in standard form, there is a shortcut that you can use, but it doesn't work for vertex form. So be careful about using the shortcut. And I'll explain it once we get the answer, but I'm just going to do it the usual way, right? So step one, remember the steps. Anytime you want to find the y-intercept, you set x equal to zero. So we're going to have y equals negative three, times zero squared plus 12 times zero minus four. Right. We're setting x equal to zero in this equation. And what happens is this goes away because that's just gonna equal zero. This goes away because it's equal to zero. So we get negative zero plus zero minus four. Of course, the zeros do nothing. You can just drop them, right? They don't do anything. And you just have negative four. And so y is negative four. So the shortcut is, when it's in standard form, the y-intercept is just the value of c. That's going to be the y-intercept, but only in standard form. If you look at this particular problem, the last number here is negative 9, but my y-intercept was not negative 9. My y-intercept was 7, positive 7, right? So for this vertex form, you have to calculate it. It's, you can't just read it off the equation. 
That was really weird how that changes now. Um, I think it just changed, or was it always like that? I don't know. It's just, in my mind, I just noticed it, that the line was kind of blocky or whatever. All right, so that gives me the point. Whoops, that gives me the point. Zero, comma, negative four. That's the y-intercept. So I can go ahead and plot that point. Now on Math Excel, this is all you would need to get the graph. So to graph a parabola on Math Excel, you first mark the vertex. You have to have the vertex first. And then all you have to do is plot one other point, and Math Excel can automatically figure out the rest of the graph. So if I just mark the vertex and then the y-intercept, which is this point right here, Math Excel just automatically draws it for you. On paper, though, you'll want a couple more points. This is where the x-intercepts come in handy. So if I can plot the x-intercepts, I can get a couple more points and just make the graph that much better. Right? And you might say, well, what if I don't care about making it that much better? Well, you have to because Math Excel makes you find the x-intercepts anyways, so you might as well use them to graph. Or, you know, on the test, right? Whether I have the test on Math Excel or some other platform, I'm going to ask you to find the x-intercepts no matter what. So since you're finding them and you're having to draw it on paper, you might as well use the information that you have. All right, so let's do this over here, the x-intercepts. Now I picked a mean one for us to do here and I'm regretting it because I'm already 45 minutes into this video. Again, step one, you set y equal to zero. That means I'm gonna get zero equals negative three x squared plus 12 x minus four. And now hopefully you can see what my regret is, right? And that is, this is not going to be a fun equation to solve. It's a quadratic equation. I can't solve it for x by just shoving everything to the other side of the equation because there's two x's there. So I can't just do square root and just move everything over and do plus or minus or whatever. I either have to factor it or use the quadratic formula. And so remember, we learned quadratic formula back in chapter one as well. Now for factoring, I, it's not going to factor. I can just I can see how these numbers are looking. It's not going to work out. You can you can look into it by considering the AC method, which is to take a times c, which in this case would be negative three times negative four, which is going to be twelve, and then b is also equal to twelve. So for this to factor, I have to be able to find two numbers that multiply to twelve, but also add to twelve and there aren't two numbers that you will be able to think of that do that. There, there are two numbers that do that, but they're gonna involve square roots or possibly imaginary numbers, um, but no ordinary simple numbers will multiply to 12 and also add to 12, right? What numbers do we know that multiply to 12? Well, six and two, but that adds up to eight, and four and three, which add up to seven, and 12 and one, which add up to 13. So nothing fits that description, which means it's not factorable, but it's still solvable, we just have to use the quadratic formula. So this is like worst case scenario, the worst thing that can happen on this problem because we've already done so much other stuff and now we have to take the time to do this. So maybe what I'll do to maybe save some time on the recording so you don't have to sit there and watch me work out the details every little step at a time. And this way my talking doesn't add more time to the video. I'll pause it, I'll solve it using the quadratic formula and then I'll resume it and so you can, when you're watching this, you can pause it if you need more time to write down the work, but that way, um, you know, we can just kind of get through that step a little bit quicker. So I'm gonna pause it and then work it out and then show you the result. Okay, so here's what I came up with and you can see I'm not the most organized person. Um, let's start back at the beginning. So we plug in zero for Y. We have to solve this by the quadratic formula. Here's the quadratic formula. Identify A, B, and C, plug them into the formula. And then you start to simplify. So 12 squared gives you 144. This one you got to be careful because it's negative times a negative times a negative, which is still going to be negative. And you get 48. Pretty sure about that. I didn't actually double check, but that's 16 times 3. Pretty sure that's 48. Uh, which gives me 96 when I subtract those, uh, which doesn't work out the best with the square root, but it's not imaginary. So it's actual, you know, these are actual results that we can graph, but we want to simplify it. So it's a square root. We have to split the number up to get as much outside the square root as we can. And 96 is kind of a tricky one because you might go with four, but actually the biggest number that you can split out from the 96 that simplifies is 16. So 16 times six is 96. 
And I want 16 here because the square root of 16 gives me 4 outside the square root. The 6 will just be left behind inside the square root. And because these three numbers are even, you can't, you can't cancel anything out inside the square root. That's cut off from everything else. But all of these numbers outside the square root, you can divide the same thing out of all three of them. So they can all be divided by 2. Now what I did is I divided by negative 2. So negative 12 divided by negative 2 is positive 6. Negative 6 divided by negative 2 is positive 3. And then 4 divided by 2 is what gives me the 2. When I divide this one by a negative, the positive 1 becomes negative, but then the negative 1 becomes positive, right? Negative 4 divided by negative 2 would be positive 2. So even though these would switch, you would still have a plus and a minus, so you just keep it the same as plus or minus. But if you didn't like getting rid of the negative signs there, if that doesn't make sense or whatever, you can just leave them there. It's the, the These two would give you the same answers either way. Um, so you could either leave it like, you could rewrite it like this or just leave it with the negative signs, but you do need to reduce it. You need to divide out the twos. So what you would type in the math Excel is, you know, again, as a solution to the equation, it's fine to leave it like this. You can't simplify it any further uh, by splitting it out with plus and minus separately. Nothing combines together. But we do want to, you know, or how do I want to say this? Math Excel is asking us, what are the x-intercepts? So we need to identify, here are the x-intercepts, and we want to do it in an exact fashion. So you don't want to plug this into your calculator either when you're typing it into Math Excel. It wants the exact fraction with the radical and everything. But it does want to know what are the two points? What are the two x-intercepts? So for that reason, we do need to split these up. And so you have one x-intercept with the plus sign and one x-intercept with the minus sign. The y-coordinate for both of them is zero. And this is the x-coordinate and this is the x-coordinate, right? One with the plus sign, one with the minus sign. And so those would be your two x-intercepts that you would type into Math Excel with the exact values. But for practical purposes, these aren't very helpful. Where do I plot this number? I don't know what that is. What is 6 plus 2 squared to 6 over 3? The example I always give in class is if I told you I ran 6 plus 2 squared to 6 over 3 miles today, you wouldn't know how far I ran because that number doesn't really compute for us, right? We, we don't have a sense of the magnitude of that number. And we need the magnitude to know exactly where to place it in the graph. And so for Math Excel, you want to leave it like this. It's the exact answer. It's the correct answer. But for graphing it, you want to actually find out what it's equal to as a decimal. And so in the case where we use the plus sign, this works out to be about 3.6. You don't need more decimal places than that because you can't graph it any more accurately than that anyways. So 3.6, which would be about halfway between 3 and 4 on the x-axis. So it'd be about right here. That's about as good as I'm going to get it. And then in the case where you use the minus sign, you get this, which when you plug it into your calculator gives you positive 0 0.4, which is about half. So it'd be halfway between 0 and 1, about right here. And that kind of fits with the picture that's emerging from the other information that we already have. The last thing you can do is use the symmetry from the y-intercept to get another point for free. So this y-intercept is 2 to the left of the axis of symmetry. So if I go 2 to the right, I should have a mirror image point located right there. And again, from these five points, you get a pretty sharp image of what the parabola looks like. Again, I'm going to pause it in order to draw it. Um, and then I'll resume so you can see what it looks like. Okay, and so here's the best I'm going to be able to do in drawing it. Again, just make sure it's not like a jagged point. You know, try to make it as rounded as you can. And, you know, I'm not going to expect better from you than what I'm able to manage to do on these videos. So, you know, this is definitely not a perfect drawing, but it's good enough. Has all the right characteristics in the right places. And so that's good enough for me, if that's how you draw your graph on, on the test. All right, so uh, let's, I don't want to skip anything, but uh, we're, we're getting pretty close to the end. So we have one more example. Now notice the directions are different here. So um, on the homework, you're going to have some problems where you just do one thing at a time. So I kind of jumped to the middle of the homework assignment where they ask you to do everything. Find the vertex, the intercepts, the axis of symmetry, the opening, and graph it. But earlier in the homework, you'll have problems that say, just find the vertex. Or you'll have problems that say, just find the x-intercepts. So you just have to do one thing on those problems. 
I think there's some problems like that. But I thought, why piddle around doing examples of just doing one thing at a time? Let's just do an example where everything is going on at once. And then I can show you everything that needs to be done um, in one example instead of having like five different examples to illustrate it. Now, this is one of the earlier problems in the homework. Um, it's asking not for the graph. It doesn't ask for the vertex. It doesn't ask for any of the stuff that we just did. But you have to find some of that stuff in order to answer this question. So this says find the range of this quadratic function. Now remember the range is the possible values for y, which is how far down the graph goes, how far up the graph goes. So that's what we want to find from this equation. And the maximum or minimum value of the function. I'll talk about what that is in a second. We kind of already have, right? The vertex is either the highest point on the graph or the lowest point on the graph. Another word for highest is maximum. Another word for lowest is minimum. So that's related to the vertex. Identify the intervals on which the function is increasing or decreasing. So again, that's a chapter two topic that they're bringing up again in chapter three. So I hope you didn't forget about how to do increasing, decreasing, and constant which is something that we went over in chapter two because we're having to use it again right here. All of this information, there's a lot of things they're asking for, but all of this stuff can be found by finding the vertex and the opening of the parabola. That's all you need in order to answer all of these questions. So it's really rather amazing. It, and it doesn't ask you to find the vertex. It doesn't ask you to find the opening of the parabola, but you would have to know that if I want to get these answers, I need to know the vertex and the opening of the parabola. And it turns out you don't need anything else. You don't need the intercepts. You don't need the axis of symmetry. That alone will give us enough information to find the range, the intervals where it's increasing and decreasing, the maximum or minimum value. All right. Now, I, I kind of took it easy. Like that last problem was kind of hard, right, with that quadratic formula stuff. So for this example, I decided to take it a little bit easier on us by giving us a problem that's already in vertex form. So this is in vertex form. This is the formula for vertex form. And the vertex, when it's in vertex form, is located at h comma k. So again, all we have to do is identify h and k, and we have our vertex, just like that. Right? h in this case is positive 9. Right? There's a minus sign in the equation, but h is what's after the minus sign, which is the number 9. It's a positive 9. If this was a plus 9, then h would be negative 9. Um, we didn't have an example of that, so poor choice on my part. I should have picked one where there was a plus sign here, but I just told you how that would work, right? So if this was plus 9, h would be negative 9. k keeps the same sign of that number, so k would be negative 6. So that's the vertex for this function. Now, does it open up or open down? Again, I can tell pretty quickly by just looking at the value of a. a is equal to 1, right? There's no number here, so it must be a 1. That's positive which tells me that the parabola opens, I guess I should write it down here, it opens up. Now that tells us everything we need to know to answer all these questions, but if you leave it like this, you probably still don't know what the answers are. What's the range? Where is it increasing? Where is it decreasing? We need, all of those questions really require a visual in order to answer, right? The range is how far down, how far up. Increasing is where is the graph going up? Decreasing is where is it going down? We need to visualize it in order to identify all that stuff. So what we want to do is sketch the parabola with just this information. We don't need any more detail than what we have here in our graph. We just need to have the vertex and whether the parabola should go up from there or down from there. So let's go ahead and sketch this graph. We have the vertex at 9, comma, negative 6. Notice I'm not even bothering like marking out the numbers. I don't need it to look that perfect. I'm just, this is a really rough sketch of what this graph looks like but it's good enough to answer the questions that we need to answer. So the vertex is located here, 9 comma negative 6. From there, the parabola opens up. So from the vertex, it's going to open up and look something like this. Okay, maybe not quite that. It's a rough sketch. It doesn't have to look perfect, but I, I can't let that go. So it's going to look something like that, right? And this is good enough to get everything that we need. So the range, how far down does the graph go? How far up does it go? The range here, how far down does it go? Negative 6. That's the lowest y-coordinate on the graph, which occurs at the vertex. How far up does it go? Infinity. All right, so the range is negative 6 to infinity. And we can, again, we can see that by looking at the rough sketch that we just made. 
find the maximum or minimum. Notice they use the word or there. There's not both. There isn't both a maximum and a minimum. There's one or the other. And we have to decide. So Math Excel on some of these problems, some of them it'll tell you, but other ones they make you pick. It gives you a drop down menu. And you either have to pick maximum or minimum. It's going to be, I, I want to say it's your choice, but you have to pick the right one. All right. So if the parabola opens up, the vertex is at the bottom of the parabola, which makes it a minimum, right? It's the lowest point on the graph. So the vertex is at a minimum when the parabola opens up. So that, you know, again, those words kind of seem to have opposite connotations, right? The parabola is opening up, but that means the vertex is at the bottom, which makes it a minimum value. So this time it will be a minimum. And it wants to know the minimum value of the function. Remember, function notation is the y value. So when they ask for the, you know, value of the function, they're asking for the y value. So they want to know what's, in this case, it's a minimum. What's the minimum y value in this function? What's the lowest number that y can equal? It's the same thing that we just identified over here in the range, right? It's negative six. So the minimum y, I guess I should put y here. The minimum function value is y equals negative six. Right. It's the lowest y value in the graph. It's the lowest number that y can equal in this equation. And so it's a minimum and that minimum value is negative six. There is no maximum because the graph goes up forever. You never reach a maximum because it just keeps going. What about increasing and decreasing? Well, if you look at the graph, remember, for increasing and decreasing, you have to start from the left-hand side. You always have to start from the left-hand side. And as you look to the right, you see that the parabola is actually heading down as we go to the right. So this part here is decreasing. So let me mark that, decreasing. And this part here, so once you hit the vertex, the graph starts heading back up and it's increasing. But remember, it's not enough just to be able to point to the graph and say, here's where it's decreasing, here, here's where it's increasing. We have to describe it using numbers. And the numbers you want to use are the x values. What numbers of x do we have the graph decreasing? Well, since we're starting from the very left-hand side, we're starting from negative infinity, and the graph continues to decrease as we go to the right, until we hit x equals 9, right? Until we hit the vertex, which is where x is equal to 9. That's where it stops decreasing. So from negative infinity to 9, the graph is heading down as we move to the right. So from negative infinity to positive 9, I don't know why I'm putting a negative there, positive 9. Now, I'm, I'm have, so if I'm worried about other people watching the video besides just my students. I don't think anybody is from what I can tell, it's just my students watching. But for our textbook on Math Excel or my math lab, uh, we're currently using Math Excel, but I think we might be making the change to my math lab soon. So maybe if I keep using these videos for the next couple of years, we might be on my math lab at this point. And I assume we're using the same textbook if you're still watching this video. They want us to use brackets here, but in calculus, you would actually, my, my understanding and from what I've heard from other people, the way they learned it is that this should really be a parentheses because at the number nine itself, it's where it's switching from decreasing to increasing. So it's sort of a break even point where it's not doing either. It's stopped decreasing. It's about to start increasing. Um, and so you shouldn't include it. You should use parentheses here on the nine. But if you do that, for our textbook, it counts that wrong. It wants you to use a bracket. And again, I don't know if maybe the thinking on that has changed um, since I was taught calculus. Maybe that little detail was modified or something. But um, so just to, to warn you, if you happen to be a student who plans to take trigonometry and then calculus, if you for some reason somehow remember this particular lesson, and you, you might say, Mr. Fallon said use a bracket here. Your teacher in calculus might say you should use a parentheses, and they're probably right. So, but for us, we're going to use a bracket. Then from nine, as we keep going to the right forever, so we're going to head to infinity, but from nine to infinity, the graph is going up. And so brackets on the nine again to infinity. And so that's where it's increasing. So that's how you find all that information from just the vertex and the opening of the parabola. 
The last topic in this section is optimization problems. These are word problems. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. But the nice thing about these word problems is I can make it simple for you by telling you you just want to find the vertex. Because if you're trying to optimize, optimize means to either maximize something or minimize something. So for example, if you're running a business, you want to optimize your revenue. You want to get as much revenue as possible, right? Or maybe more than just getting more revenue, you want to optimize your profits, right? You want the profits to be as high as you possibly can, as you can possibly make them. And so that's maximizing profit. That's an optimization problem. How, what, how do I operate my business to maximize my profits? That's optimization. Um, if you're running a business and you're making things, you want to minimize the cost of making those things, right? That's another optimization problem because you're trying to minimize, you're trying to keep the cost as low as you possibly can. Um, so this optimization is a very uh, important mathematical application. Now, a lot of optimization can only be done using calculus. So in calculus, you actually will learn the tools for how to maximize and minimize, or how to find maximum and minimum values of different functions. And we're not going to learn calculus today, but for quadratic functions, we can actually find the minimum or maximum without calculus. And we just did, right? We just did that problem where we found the minimum function value was negative six. That was an optimization question. What's the smallest y value that you can make this function equal? It was negative six. That was minimizing it. Um, and, and, you know, there's, I don't know, I've taken, and maybe not only, you might need more than calculus sometimes to optimize situations. Because I want to say I took like a, I think it was called linear programming class. And you try to like, for instance, if you're traveling like a salesman, you might want to minimize the distance that you have to travel or minimize the amount of gas that you have to consume when you're traveling. So you can keep the gas cost down. And that kind of question may not be susceptible as much to calculus, but there's this other branch of math called like linear programming, where you would like try these different paths and try to find the path that minimizes some particular factor. I remember I took a class on it, really interesting stuff, but this is, this is big, you know, this is, uh, how do I want to say, this is a big deal, right? Optimization is a big deal for a lot of applications in industry, in business, uh, in engineering. You're always trying to maximize or minimize things. Um, for efficiency, to make things function as efficient as possible. So um, anyways, the maximum or the minimum function value for a quadratic function is found at the vertex. So in these word problems, if they ask you to find the maximum or the minimum of something, that means you should find the vertex. And that's as simple as I can make these word problems. So they'll, they'll give you a quadratic function and to maximize or minimize the, the, the function value, you find the vertex of that quadratic function and you'll, you will get your answer from the vertex. The one decision that you're gonna to have to make is, do I want the X coordinate from the vertex? Does that answer my question? Or does the Y coordinate answer my question? Sometimes you need the Y coordinate, that's what they want. Other times you just need the X coordinate. So you have to kind of decide what those, are, what those mean. What is the X coordinate telling me? What's the Y coordinate telling me? In order to know which one answers the question that you're being asked. All right, so let's take a look at one of these problems. So if an archer shoots an arrow straight upward with an initial velocity of 192 feet per second from a height of four feet, then its height above the ground in feet at time t in seconds is given by the function h of t equals negative 16 t squared plus 192 t plus four. I know, information overload. I stopped processing that back at like four feet, right? I kind of gave up after that. But read it through just to kind of get a sense of what's going on. Part A, what is the maximum height reached by the arrow? So if you see the word maximum, you should immediately think vertex. If you see the word minimum, you should immediately think vertex. I don't think there's many word problems in this section where you want to minimize something. They're all maximizing. This time we're looking for the maximum height. Um, so maximum or minimum vertex, that's what you want to find. And they were kind enough to actually give me the quadratic function. So I don't have to actually piece it together, which you're going to see sometimes you have to do. We have another example after this one where 
they don't give you the quadratic function, you have to find it first. That one's kind of a tough problem. But if they give you the quadratic function and you're trying to maximize it, you can just jump right into finding the vertex, which we'll do in just a second. Real quick, I just want to kind of point out the, the numbers in this function. The 192 that you see in the equation comes from the initial velocity. So that number becomes the coefficient of your middle term. Um, and the initial height of four feet shows up in the equation here. So the four becomes the constant term of your quadratic function. What does this term have to do with? And so I like to ask my class this question and I'll, I'll sit there and wait and people kind of don't, they're like, I don't know what it could be. It's not mentioned anywhere in the problem, but think about the scenario. We're shooting an arrow into the air. What physical uh, th thing, I don't know what, if there, there should be a better word for that, but what physical process is in play when things go into the air? Gravity, right? So the gravity of the earth will bring that thing back down as long as it's not going too fast, right? And so that's what this term is about. This negative 16 is in relation to the gravity. It's the gravitational pull of the earth. And the thing I like to point out to students is that if you were to move this problem to the moon or to Mars, that number would not be negative 16 because the gravity is different on those surfaces and that would cause this number to change. So on the earth, it's going to be negative 16 every time, but on different in different parts of space, it would be a different number, right? If you're on different bodies, um, if you're on Mars or the moon or whatever. Anyways, just thought I'd point that out. Now, what this function is telling me is the height, right? H of t, that's the height, after t seconds. So I know that it gave like a really verbal description, like very verbose, but the height is in feet, the time is in seconds, and so this tells me how high the arrow will be if I wait this many seconds. This equation will calculate that height. Now it's ignoring some things. I remember one time uh, my kids had made a little, uh, like a, how do you say, like a, it's a simple machine, like a lever, I guess. It was like this, right? A fulcrum. I don't know what it's called, but they, they kind of, they had like a brick or something. And then they had like a board going across the brick. And then they were putting a stuffed animal on one end and then they were jumping on the other end. And of course it was sending the stuffed animal flying into the air. So I was trying to kind of estimate using this equation, like how high that stuffed animal was actually going into the air. I was just curious to know, like how high is it gonna go up? And I tried to estimate like how heavy my kids were, how much that initial velocity would be. And I ended up getting kind of a big number. And I'm like, I don't think the stuffed animal's going up that high. And so I asked the physics teacher, cause I'm, I'm not a physics teacher, I'm the math teacher. But I was like, why, why is my calculation saying it'll go up like 200 feet when I can see it's clearly just you know, it's barely getting over the trees. It's not, you know, going 200 feet into the air. Um, and so one thing that's being ignored here is air resistance. Now an arrow probably isn't gonna experience much air resistance anyways, uh, but that would be a factor that would slow it down, uh, slow down the ascent of it and make it fall back down maybe a little bit sooner. Um, but also like for the fulcrum example, you know, when my kid was jumping on the end, there's, you know, there's heat loss, right? Cause there's friction there. So you kind of lose some of that energy in friction, you lose it in heat. Um, you know, it's, it's not a perfect launch, you know, kind of, you know, again, there's just friction involved in like multiple places. And so that would, you know, lower the height of the stuffed animal, but, you know, so really taking into account every factor that's in play may not be possible, um, you know, for these problems. So we're just simplifying the scenario, ignoring wind resistance, ignoring friction, all that stuff. And in that case, this is the equation that you want to use to measure how high up something will go. And the maximum height will occur at the vertex. So I want to find the vertex. Now this is in standard form, right? This is y equals, let's use a different color. Right, this is y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. It's in standard form. So to find the vertex in standard form, we have to use this formula, negative b over 2a. B is 192, A is negative 16. So let's plug those numbers in. Don't forget the negative sign in the formula. Negative, B is 192 over two times A, which is negative 16. And so we're gonna get negative 192 over negative 32, which is going to give me, well, I should know this, six. I think it'll be six. And now I'm using X here because it's the X coordinate of the vertex. 
But the x variable in this problem is actually the time. So if I really wanted to use the right letter here, I should have used t. And this will be six seconds. So another thing I'll ask my class is, OK, so this is six. What does that tell me? And some students will say, oh, it's six feet. That's the height. No, that's not the height. The height is the y coordinate, right? The y, the y variable is the function value, which is the height. The x variable is the time. And so it's going to be six seconds, not six feet. It will take six seconds for the arrow to reach its maximum height. So now I know how long I have to wait before the arrow will reach its maximum height. But I want to know what that height will be. So to find the height, you have to take six and plug it into your function to find the y value. So, so again, like I mentioned earlier, for these word problems, you'll have to decide, do I want the x coordinate or the y coordinate of the vertex to answer this question? Well, for this one, the maximum height will be the y coordinate. So I want the y coordinate of the vertex. But to get the y coordinate, you have to find the x coordinate first. So I found the x coordinate. It's six seconds. Now I can find the y coordinate by plugging that into the function. Right? And so I'm going to get h of six. It's supposed to be an h here. Oh. Okay. Uh, equals negative 16 times six squared plus 192. Ah, oh, jumped ahead of myself there. 192 times six plus four. And so that's going to give me, I should just use a calculator. It'll save us some time anyways, right? So plug that into your calculator. You get negative 16 times six squared plus 192 times six plus four. And I get 580. All right, so 580. Now this is in feet. So ignoring wind resistance, which I think is perfectly a, a good uh, thing to do with an arrow because those things are aerodynamically designed to cut through the air without much resistance you would expect the arrow to go 580 feet into the air it's going to reach a height of 580 feet and then it's going to fall back down right now so what's really going on here is you have somebody standing here shooting the arrow from from a height of four feet right this is four feet right here and that's where the arrow is launching from and then it's going straight up and then coming straight back down, right? So even though this is a quadratic function, the graph of it looks like this, right? It's, you know, it opens down because A is negative. The maximum height occurs here on the graph, but that this, it's easy to confuse, but sometimes I, I've done this. I think, oh, that's the path of the arrow. The arrow is doing this kind of a, a parabolic path, but no, the arrow is doing this. It's going straight up, coming straight back down. But when you map out the height of the arrow over time, Right. You want to know how high is the arrow after one second, right? Well, it's right here, right after after one second. How high is the arrow after two seconds, right? It's going to be right here. How high is it after three? Now, of course, this should happen at six seconds. So I'm really not scaling this very well, but you get the idea that when you take this situation, the time that has passed versus the height that the arrow has reached and plot those as points, this is the shape of the graph that you get. Anyways, part A, the answer is 580 feet. Part B is not about the vertex. So here it says, how long does it take for the arrow to reach the ground? Right. So this is not about the vertex. So let's maybe do this problem off to the side over here. All right. So here's our function, h of t equals negative 16 t squared plus 192t plus 4. And so I'll ask my class, we want to know how long it's going to take for the arrow to reach the ground. So what is that telling me, right? For the arrow to reach the ground, the height of the arrow is zero feet. So they could have spelled it out for us. They could have said, find the time for when the height is zero, right? And just kind of directly told us you want H to equal zero, but they didn't. They want us to infer that from the description, right? Because that's a lot of what you know, practical math is about is figuring out how do I take this abstract mathematical concept and apply it to like a concrete example. And we have to understand like, well, when we, if we want, it's an interesting question. When should I expect the arrow to land back on the ground? Because the person that shot the arrow better get out of the way before then, right? So we want to let them know, well, you're going to have this many seconds before the arrow is going to hit you on the head when you, when it comes back down. So make sure you move out of the way, right? Um, it's an interesting question to ask. When is it going to come back down to the ground? But that question doesn't tell you how it connects to the abstract mathematical formula or the abstract mathematical model that we have. 
And so we have to be able to translate it, right? So what does it mean for the arrow to have reached the ground? It means that the height above the ground is zero, right? When the arrow hits the ground, it's zero feet above the ground. And so the height is zero. We have to infer that from the question. And so we want the height to be zero for part B. And so we get zero equals negative 16 T squared plus 192t plus 4. And now we have to solve this equation, which is a quadratic equation. And unfortunately, this is not factorable again. So how are we going to solve it? We have to use the quadratic formula. So why don't we do another time saver here? I'm going to pause the video and work this out off camera. And why don't you pause the video and see if you can work it out on your own paper. Use the quadratic formula, plug these numbers in, and simplify it and see how far you can get with that. What we're looking for is an actual time, right? How many seconds is it going to be? So, which is going to involve taking your answer, plugging it into your calculator and getting a decimal for it. But see if you see how far you can get and see if you can get it into your calculator and get a decimal answer. And then resume the video to see if you came up with the right result. Okay, so there's the quadratic formula. We take A, which is negative 16, B, which is 192, C, which is 4, and we plug those numbers into the quadratic formula, and you get this. And then we have to simplify it. So what I did was I plugged this part into my calculator, just the inside the square root part, and I got this number here, right? 30, 37,000, I was about to say 3,000, but 37,120. Right. Now, you could maybe split that up and try to get something outside the square root, but don't bother because... We're not trying to get an exact radical form answer here. The directions even say how many seconds till it hits the ground, round to two decimal places. So it's telling you, just plug it in your calculator and get a decimal for this one, right? And so I'm not going to try to simplify that radical. I'll just leave it as 37,120. But I need, but there's two answers here, right? There's one answer where we use the plus sign. There's one answer where we use the minus sign. And so we need to check both of those and see what we get. So when you use the plus sign and you plug this into your calculator, you get the time to be negative 0.02 whatever seconds. But that is a nonsense answer. You can't have a negative amount of time and so we can throw that answer out. When you use the minus sign, you actually get the sensible answer here, which is 12.02, which is what you should expect. So as a rule of thumb, the time it takes to reach the maximum height, how do I want to say it? Maybe I should say it the other way. The time for the time it takes for the arrow to reach the ground again should be about twice the amount that it takes to reach the maximum height. And we found over here that it takes six seconds to reach the maximum height. So it should take about another six seconds for the arrow to hit the ground. And it's a little bit more than six seconds because the initial height was four feet. We didn't launch, we didn't launch. <laughs> Making up words here. We didn't launch our arrow. See, like, I don't know, when I hear people misspeak like that, like I just did, um, we like you're thinking ahead about the words you're about to say, and then you incorporate a syllable from a future word into the word that you're currently saying. So I said launch because I was about to say arrow, right? And that, that syllable shows up in the wrong word. I saw this one guy on YouTube do that too. Like he said it's a word in a funny way, and then he laughed at himself, and then when he said it the right way, the next couple of words had that syllable that he kind of accidentally inserted. So common mistake and just interesting how people's minds work. But uh, what was I even saying, right? Because we launch the arrow from four feet above the ground, that kind of causes that asymmetry. If we had launched the arrow from the ground and it took six seconds to reach the maximum height, it would take another six seconds to get back to the ground. Then it would be perfectly symmetric. But because we started at four feet, it puts it off a little bit, you know, like this graph kind of shows over here, right? So we started at four feet, then it goes up, reaches the maximum height. And then when it, it takes, so think about this, it takes six seconds to get back down to four feet, right? So that's where the symmetry is. It takes six seconds to go from four feet to its maximum height, another six seconds to get back down to four feet, but then it needs a little bit more time to fall the rest of the way to the ground. That's where that 0.02 comes in, right? Anyways, that is the answer to part B. We have one more example, and it's kind of a doozy, but let's go ahead and see how quickly we can get this one done, and then we're done. A rectangular playground is to be fenced off and divided in two by another fence parallel to one side of the playground. Right. 
So it's going to look something like this. Now, normally I like to read the question all the way through, but let's just draw a picture, right? We're going to have a rectangular playground and it's going to be fenced. It's going to be divided in two. So a, so we need four pieces of fence to make the rectangle. And then we will need a fifth side of the fence to fence down the middle to divide it into two, right? Now it doesn't say which way. Is it dividing it this way or is it dividing it this way? I don't know. And mathematically, like setting it up, doesn't matter which one you assume. The numbers will reveal the truth of like what the dimension should look like. So while I'm drawing this side as my small dimension and this side as my large dimension, when I actually solve the equation, it could say this small one is 50 feet and this one's 10 feet, right? It could be, I, I drew my picture backwards, but the numbers will still be the right numbers, even though my picture might not reflect it exactly. So this is sufficient to model from in order to get our equations to get the right answer, All right? So we're fencing in a rectangular area and then fencing down the middle to divide it into two. And it's parallel to one side. We don't know which side and it doesn't matter mathematically. It'll work out either way. 360 feet of fencing is used. So what's going on here is they want to, you know, create a playground area, but budget restraints or whatever, they only have 360 feet of fence. And they want to set up this configuration. Maybe they want like a playground for the small kids, a playground for the big kids, and they want to put a fence to divide the two, right? So um, that's the constraints we're working under. They only have 360 feet of fence, but they're nice people. So they want to make as big of an area as possible with the amount of fence that they have to use. Now, some, you know, not just students, but people in general don't realize that even with the same amount of fence, depending on how you, you know, set up the dimensions of the area that you're fencing in, you get different areas, right? So even with the same amount of fence, the areas will be different depending on the dimensions that you choose. Right. So as a aside, just to kind of think about this, right, let's say you had 100 feet of fencing and you wanted to just fence in. Don't worry about like fencing down the middle. Let's just say we want to fence a rectangle with 100 feet of fence. Right. One way to do that would be 20 feet by 30 feet. That would give you 100 feet of fence. Right. Because there's 50 right here. And then the opposite sides would be another 50. That's 100 feet of fence altogether. What's the area? with this 100 feet of fence. Well, if it's 20 by 30, the area is gonna be 20 times 30, which will be 600, 600 square feet, right? Now, if I take the same amount of fence, but instead I do it like this, 10 feet by 40 feet, that's again, 50 feet, and another 50 feet means that's 100 feet of fence altogether. What's the area this time? It's 40 times 10, which is only 400, right? So it makes a difference. Even with the same amount of fence, these both have 100 feet of fence, the dimensions you choose will determine the area that gets enclosed and it will be different depending on the dimensions that you select. Now, for a normal rectangle without the fencing down the middle part, the, air, the, the dimensions that will maximize the area is a square, right? So with 100 feet of fence, if I wanna get the maximum area, I want to do 25 by 25, right? That's going to give me an area of 625. And I know that is the maximum area. So I don't have to keep searching for other dimensions that give me a bigger area. You can't get a bigger area than 625 if you're only using 100 feet of fencing, right? A square is going to give you the biggest area possible. So keep that in mind, right? If you're doing any kind of construction or home improvement and you get to decide, I have this much fence, and you want to get the biggest area possible, unless you're doing some crazy thing like dividing it into two, a square will give you the biggest area possible um, when you're, you know, creating a rectangular area of some kind. All right. Now, because we want to fence down the middle, it actually changes things. All right. So now what's going to maximize the area? That's what we, and I didn't finish reading the question, but find the dimensions of the playground that maximize the area. I just want you to realize that it matters the dimensions you choose. Cause some students will say it doesn't matter. 360 feet of fence, the area is the same no matter what. And that is not true. All right. So I want to make sure we give these kids the biggest area possible to play with this 360 feet of fence that we have to use. So I don't know what these dimensions should be. So I'm going to use variables, All right? I'll call this one Y. And I'll call this one X. It doesn't matter which one you call which. 
if this side's y, then this side is also y. If this, the top part is x, the bottom part's also x, but also the part down the middle will have the same length as this parallel side. So this side would also be x. And we have to use fence for all five parts. And those five parts have to add up to the amount of fence that we're going to be using. So I have two y's and I have three x's that will have to add up to the 360 feet of fence that we're using, right? So that's all the fence I have and I want to use all of it. So it'll have to add up to 360 feet. All right. Now, this has nothing to do with area. This is just like a perimeter kind of thing, right? This is just how much fence we're using that's going to have to go around the whole thing and down the middle. The area is length times width, just like we were talking about over here. The length is, it doesn't matter which one's which. I don't know which one to call which one. Uh, the length is, I guess, the longer side. So the length is y and the width is x. I think that's kind of how people normally do that. So the area of this rectangle, even with the part down the middle, we cut, that does take up some of the area, some of the space in there, but we're going to assume it's one dimensional and doesn't really take up any area. So the area is still just going to be length times width, which is going to be y times x, right? That's the area of this rectangle, right? Now, this is what we want to maximize. I want to maximize this area, which will happen at the vertex, right? So as soon as I see maximize, I immediately think vertex. But in order to find a vertex, I need a quadratic equation, a quadratic formula. I just can't get this X right. Okay, let's try it again. All right, there we go. So when I see maximize, I think, okay, vertex, I need to find the vertex. What do I find the vertex of? I need a quadratic function to find the vertex of. They didn't give me one. So I'm slowly building one out of this information. I have a relationship between the length and the width here, between X and Y. It's this relationship here, which is governed by the fact that we have to limit the amount of fence we use to 360 feet. I can plug this into my formula for area, which is the thing I'm trying to maximize. And by doing that, because I can't really maximize this while I have three variables here, right? That's, this is not quadratic and it's too many variables to really work with. But I can use this to eliminate one of these variables. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve this for y and then plug it in for y here, and I'm going to take y out, and in place of it will be some expression with x. And so now I'll just have a and x. And when you do that, it becomes a quadratic function. You'll see in just a second. So let's solve this for y. We'll subtract 3x to the other side, and we're going to get, uh, where can I go? Uh, let's go back up top here. Uh, that might be too far away, but let's just do it up here. 2y equals 360 minus 3x, right? I'm subtracting the 3x to the other side. Then I will divide by 2 to get y by itself. And so that's going to give me y equals, and then I want to simplify this. So I'm going to take the 2 and divide it into each term separately. So 360 divided by 2 is 180 minus 3 over 2 is just going to be 3 over 2. It doesn't simplify. It's just going to be a fraction. But then we put the x to the side of that fraction. It's, this is something we did back in chapter one, again, solving, it's a linear equation, we're solving it for y. So we we should have had some practice doing this in chapter one, right? And so we get this, it's a linear equation. We wanna plug that into this equation for area, right? So let's take what y is equal to here, substitute it into the um, formula down here. All right, so we'll still have a, but in place of y, we're going to have, I'm just trying to fit everything on the screen at once, but it's just not working out. Um, we'll have 180 minus, unfortunately, a fraction, 3 halves x. Well, let's try that again. I don't, know, I don't know what's going on. Maybe I'm just getting a little tired or something. I'm just not drawing some of my letters very well, so I apologize for that. And then this x copies down, right? So here was y. It got replaced with this, which I'm putting parentheses around. But we still had an x in the equation that has to get copied down beside it, right? And then when you distribute the x to get rid of the parentheses, you see it becomes a quadratic function, right? A equals 180x minus 3 halves x squared. It's a quadratic function now. And if I want to maximize the area, which is the y value here, I can maximize it at the vertex. 
So just remember, for all these word problems, they're just vertex problems. That's what I like to tell my students in class. Yes, they're word problems, but they're really just vertex problems. Now, this one was especially difficult because it's a vertex problem without a quadratic function to work from yet, right? I, I said that weird, but it's a, it's a vertex problem, but you don't have a quadratic function from which to find the vertex initially. And so you have to, um, you know, construct your quadratic function first. And that's where all the work is on this problem. And then once you have the quadratic function, it's just find the vertex, right? And it's in, it's, it's in a weird order, but it's in standard form. So we want to use the formula that we did on the last problem, negative b over 2a. b in this case is the 180, right? b is the number in front of x, right? So if you think of the formula, ax squared plus bx plus c, b is the coefficient of the x term, regardless of where it's located, right? Now, normally we call that the middle term because normally you write it in order and it'll be in the middle, but it doesn't have to be. It can be scrambled around. Just remember, b is the number in front of x. So it's going to be 180. So I get negative 180 over 2 times a, which is the number in front of x squared, which is this negative 3 halves. All right? Again, a is the number in front of x squared. It's going to be negative 3 halves, which, yeah, it's a fraction, but it works out just fine with this situation, right? Oh, just now I can't, I can't write x's. I can't write 3's. Let's try that one more time. Okay. Now, what works out fine here is that the 2's cancel out, right? You have this 2 in the denominator. It cancels out with this 2 here. So you end up with negative 180 divided by negative 3, and it works out beautifully. You get 60, right? Now, we, ha we didn't talk about it already, but you have to make a decision at some point. Do I need the y coordinate of the vertex? I just found the x coordinate. Is that what I need, or do I need the y coordinate instead? Now, the, it's a little tricky here because I'm using y to represent the length of my rectangle, but the y coordinate of the vertex is not that. The y coordinate of the vertex would be the area, right? This is the y, the y value of the quadratic function. And so if I'm finding the y coordinate of the vertex, I'd be finding the area of the rectangle, which I actually don't want. I don't need to know that. I want, I'm trying to maximize the area, but it doesn't ask me to find what that maximum area is. What the problem asked was, what are the dimensions that would maximize the area? I'm just looking for the dimensions. And I found one of them, right, which is x, which is 60, right? That is the width of my rectangle. That's one of the dimensions. I want to find the length, not the area. So actually, for this problem, I don't need the y-coordinate of the vertex because that would just tell me the area and I wasn't asked to find that information. You can find it if you want, but you don't need it to answer the problem, uh, this question. All right. What you need is the length of the rectangle, which is what I called y earlier in the problem. Maybe I should have used a different letter. Um, but this, I want to find what this is equal to, which is not part of the vertex. I'm done with the vertex. I got what I needed out of it. I just needed the x-coordinate. That gave me one of the dimensions. And then this, I didn't scroll up far enough, but this is going to give me the other dimension, right? So I know x is equal to 60. So I can take that value for x and plug it in to this formula to find the length of the rectangle, which I'm calling y, right? So I'm going to get y equals 180 minus 3 halves times 60. That's going to be 180 minus 90, which is going to give me 90. Right? And so that would be the length of the rectangle. Right, I'm sorry, I kind of put that a little close to x, but hopefully, I don't know, now I feel like it's bugging me. I don't want it to be misleading. Let me uh, draw this arrow a little bit further down so it's pretty clear that we're finding this right here. So the person constructing this playground should make the rect, if they want to get the biggest area possible given the situation, they want to make the width of the rectangle 60 feet, the length of the rectangle 90 feet, and then they want to fence down the middle parallel to the shorter side. They want this. So I, you know, again, I didn't know ahead of time, but I did happen to draw it correctly, right? The shorter side is this side, the longer side is this side. And the, the part down the middle should be parallel to the shorter side. And that will give them the biggest area possible for the kids to play in, given the 360 feet of fence. All right. So that video went on way long enough. I don't know. This, like when I cover this in class, it usually takes a day and a half. So this is this is actually probably what I should have expected, but I was hoping to be a little faster. Um, that concludes the video on section 3.1. I will see you in the next video for section 3.2.